Okay. So hello everybody and welcome to Accessibility to Inclusion uh, Beyond Physical Access. How far have we come? How far have we to go? And this session is going to provide an overview of University of Birmingham's estate developments over the last hundred years, moving beyond considerations of physical access and compliance. You'll hear from Hilary Tansley and Sue Onans. Um, Hilary Tansley is a chartered building surveyor and registered on the National Register of Access Consultants. Uh, she's worked as a building surveyor in higher education for more than a decade before developing her interest in inclusive design by completing an MSc in inclusive environments and then working as an independent access consultant before joining the Estates Office at UOB as Accessibility Officer in spring 2019. Uh, Sue Onans works in a new role as Inclusivity Advisor as part of the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion team and previously she was Head of Learning Support and she's been a member of staff at UOB for the last 20 years. So thank you both so much for joining us. Um, before we get into the conversation, we will start with the um, video. And um, that, like I said, that will be about half an hour. And then we'll get into some Q&A. If anybody has any questions, just feel free to post them into the Q&A box and feel free to chat on the chat function. So let's see if the technology will work for us. This session's titled Accessibility to Inclusion and what I am seeking to do is to give an overview into the way that the university campus has changed over time and also the provisions for access and inclusion. The campus has developed since the early 1900s with the Aston Webb group of buildings and many of the other major buildings on, on campus being developed over the, over the next uh, few decades. Buildings tended to be built to impress so that you've got steps at the main entrance and also internal access barriers posed by narrow double doors internally and externally, door furniture that's harder to use, toilets located off stair landings. It's continued through to the 60s and 70s buildings um, and some of the, these buildings are also listed. One of the particular features of the later building seems to be split floor uh, levels so that you come up with a lift and then have a short flight of stairs that you need to, to move uh, up before you can reach the rest of the floor area. Now this isn't at all uncommon for buildings of the time. In fact our first legislation for access into buildings wasn't until 1970 with the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act and all that required was for parking, for access into the ground floor of buildings, for suitable sanitary facilities to be made available. Planning law didn't catch up until 1980 with the Town and Country Planning Act requiring or making uh, access to buildings some as a material planning consideration. And that's continued through today, uh, through to the current uh, national planning policy framework. A game changer legislation was the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995, which uh, placed duties on service providers and employers not to discriminate against disabled people. So initially there was a duty to change policies, practices and procedures and also to provide auxiliary aids uh, to avoid uh, dis discrimination. But it's only since 2004 that there's been a requirement to carry out reasonable adjustments to premises. So that means you have to alter or remove or avoid a physical feature of a building if necessary to make uh, buildings accessible. Within post-16 education, the uh, Sender Special Educational Needs and Disability Act of 20, 000, 2001 extended uh, duties to places like universities. And of course, now all of that's been wrapped up into the Equality Act 2010, which includes disabilities of, of the nine protected characteristics and also gives uh, an extended definition of disability to include mental health and progressive conditions. Now, the access legislation is underpinned by technical guidance, first produced in 1967 and then updated regularly 
our current guidance gives only not uh, has extended physical access guidance has made provision for people, uh, people with sensory impairments visual sight loss hearing loss and our current uh, best practice guidance is BSA 300 which was uh, dated in 2018 now there's still there is some provision within that best practice guidance for neurodiversity, but it's very limited. And it's expected that the further guidance will be forthcoming in the next year. If our technical guidance can be considered best practice, then building regs really ought to be considered as a minimum standard that we should be achieving within our buildings. And again, you can see the rate this was first introduced or building regulations first considered access for disabled people in 1985 and just continue to update the, the guidance it's expected that that will be updated fully shortly but a most recent revision in july of this year included the provision of changing places facilities in large buildings that are open to the public and that become comes into force in january of 2021 I'm told that the Tower of London has recently provided a changing place facility. Of course, if you get people into buildings, we need to get them out as well. So there is a, a raft of fire safety legislation and guidance and building regs that uh, look at making sure that everybody leaves the building in a fire emergency, including uh, means of assisted evacuation. So what we've been doing at the university, well, over the last 20 years, there's been um, a lot of modification to university buildings. All of those early buildings from the first seven decades on campus are likely to have at least one accessible toilet, at least one accessible entrance. By and large, the lifts have been updated so that you've got automatic doors and reachable and easily usable lift controls. And in a number of buildings, there are platform lifts between uh, the split floor levels. You're likely to see auto uh, openers to some doors or hold opens on corridor doors so to make, to make moving into and around buildings very much easier. Uh, assistance loops in lecture theatres or more, more recently in uh, infrared assisted, assisted listening devices. And then, of course, provision for assisted evacuation. And what I'm showing here in the photo is a refuge with a two-way comms unit and an evac chair. So that if somebody's come, gone up in the lift, it's relatively easy to get them out of the building. There have also been provisions for access outside. So that you'll see, obviously, blue badge uh, space is designated disabled drivers, dropped curbs, improved lighting, handrails to stairs and similar. And of course, the green heart, uh, although I wasn't on campus at the, before this was opened and told us uh, greatly improved the situation in terms of uh, being able to get north to west as north to south on campus and east to west. There are, of course, remaining challenges and we've got a lot of the old uh, infrastructure that still needs updating. I alluded to changing place facility. This is the facility that was provided in uh, the library uh, last summer and provides a hoist, an adjustable height changing bed, uh, a wet dry loo and a height adjustable toilet, a uh, height adjustable basin. Other facilities uh, include the uh, vibrating pager systems that link to fire alarms to make sure that people who don't hear the fire alarm can evacuate a building if necessary. Other, and uh, facilities such as high suggestible desks and lecterns, lab benches. As you might expect, our more recent buildings are far more inclusive and accessible and our sports centre that opened a couple of years ago includes a pool lift, accessible changing rooms, including another changing facility for users. 
uh, the library, which has assistive technology booths for VR users, and the teaching and learning building, of which I included a photo here, which is a far more accessible and legible building than uh, the earlier buildings on campus. To try and maintain um, our progress, the State Office now has an inclusive design guide and this will be brought into use for new buildings and for major refurbishments. It help, aims to help the estate meet the university's equality scheme. Obviously that's underpinned by access and use of buildings, but also to brief uh, project teams about the, our best practice in inclusive design and other provisions for equality and diversity so that uh, it will consider whether a parent and baby room or gender neutral toilets or other facilities may be appropriate in any new development. And it will also address the evolving duty under the Equality Act. Now this uh, evolving duty says that you don't just do access once, you do it and review it. As we've seen over time, the provisions and the accepted standard for access and inclusion changes. Uh, and by reviewing the inclusive design guide frequently, we would hope that uh, we will help to discharge that duty. Of course, once you've done all that, you need to let people know what's happening. And the university now has a campus app that's available on uh, smartphones and on the totems on campus so that it will give information about all a range of facilities, but including the accessible entrances, accessible routes, accessible parking. And it also now links with the information that's held on the university access able pages. So that I think there is something like 120 buildings that have information, uh, detailed access information, uh, and will give very much more uh, help in planning somebody's day when they come onto campus. Thank you. Any questions? So thanks for the presentation, Hilary. Um, so we've uh, got a few questions and um, the first one is, could you tell us a bit more about the work, about the work of the Estates team and how your role impacts on the approach to the university's built environment? Okay, so I work with the estates team to facilitate access improvements to the buildings for individual staff and students as and when they're required um, and as they're notified to me as a, as a requirement. Um, I also support the project teams for capital developments, both for new buildings and refurbishments. Because inclusive design is best done from the start of a project, um, I put together the, the inclusive design guide, which underlines the aspirations for best practice. But it also allows um, teams working with estates to go beyond physical access, to have some understanding of what we're trying to achieve. So not just physical access, but the sensory and neurodiversity type issues, and also incorporate facilities for things like gender neutral toilets, parent and baby rooms, um, specifically intend to support the equality scheme for the university. Great, thank you. And um, what do you consider to be the biggest um, challenges that people face on campus and um, what, what's being done to address them? Well, the biggest challenge has got to be the topography of the campus. You know, there's something like an eight metres change in level with north to south and three metres east to west. So, you know, we can't change that. Unfortunately, they built the, the university where they did 100 years ago. Obviously, there's also the issue about the geographical size of the campus and the number of legacy buildings. And I would count anything earlier than the year 2000 in that category. There is obviously still a lot of work to do. We've got to look at small incremental gains in existing buildings and around campus, and then major gains where capital projects are brought forward. It's difficult, but access may stop short of full inclusion. Um, for instance, at the medical school, 
local uh, conditions and restrictions, um, not least that it's a site of historical uh, uh, relevance. It's a Roman fort. And the costs of making the front entrance accessible means that we've had to go to the side to make an accessible entrance. Um, balancing that, the Equality Act's a requirement for equal provision in services and employment. So we can achieve that, not necessarily with the routes that we'd like to do. Um, it's unlikely that the full, sorry, that the full estate, the legacy estate will be made fully accessible. Um, the policies and practices and procedures adopted by the university will have a major impact on achieving our equality and inclusion on campus. But, of course, if we provide detailed and accurate information to people so that they know what to expect and where, then it helps people to prepare for their day and avoid some of the things that we're not able to, to alter. Yeah, absolutely. The good news, of course, is going forward with our new buildings. And, you know, we can strive for the, the full deal, as it were. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, Sue, I want to come to you now. Um, how does the work of student services help achieve um, access and inclusion on campus? Well, just um, following on from what Hilary said about the Equality Act, um, it underpins a lot of our work, but I think it goes beyond that. And I think it's important to, to take a holistic approach to accessibility and inclusion and recognise what I would term the ripple or the domino effect that decisions and actions in one area impact on other areas. There should be a joined up approach which considers the student experience and interactions with the whole campus, because um, I think it can be very um, divided. And I think we need to have that kind of holistic approach um, to, to make things happen. And this means linking with those who've got the knowledge and the exp expertise, as well as practical experience and adopting a collaborative approach. And this is where we're kind of working with um, Hillary and, and different stakeholders. So, you know, there's a whole range of stakeholders at different times. And I think what is key coming out of the legislation uh, and is, you know, something that core value is listening and responding to the student voice and the staff perspective, and then viewing them as co-creators in that kind of process. So it's that kind of linking up. Um, so although my role is to primarily work with students, I think we need to consider everyone, staff um, and visitors as users of the space and the facilities and the services. So we're not just talking about physical access for one group of people. It's kind of that going back to the holistic approach. And as Hilary mentioned, we also need to be mindful of the less visible disabilities and considering intersectionality and other considerations, including the situational context, because I think um, it's quite often it's the hidden disabilities that perhaps, you know, we, we don't um, look at me at, at addressing, you know, um, initially. So on the practical level, what does this mean? That means working, as I mentioned, with the dis dis disability team. Hillary and Estates, the library teams to look at how um, the customer service, how to interact, their um, conferencing centre, the EDI student ambassadors and HEFI, uh, just to name a few. So it, it is a kind of um, multi-dimensional approach to it. it does, this doesn't just belong with um, me in student services or Hillary. It's a whole institution um, response. And I think it's important to have collaboration to create a safe and welcoming and effective campus uh, where all people are valued and represented and it's everybody's responsibility and also that I think the key point is that it should be embedded at the heart of the planning uh, and decision making process across the institution it shouldn't just fall on the, on the kind of um, you know a few individuals in that that process. Absolutely. And um, I, I understand you've worked um, closely with Hillary on um, a number of projects. Um, can you talk me through some of these? Yes, so, um, just to give you a few examples. Uh, if we take um, the example of the new uh, teaching and learning building, well, I say new, a few months old, um, Prior to that building opening, um, Hilary and myself um, 
organised for some uh, staff members and some students with um, um, disabilities, a range of disabilities, some visible and some um, hidden disabilities to do a walkthrough of the building prior to it opening to actually kind of give their perspective um, on the um, the kind of environment, what they felt about the feel of the place, but also the kind of the practical considerations. And it was quite interesting, you know, to they kind of, you know, brought things to the fore that, you know, perhaps, um, you know, weren't um, immediately obvious um, about the kind of the white lighting and the yellow lighting and the kind of the lines of sight for the notices. When we actually were positioned in the teaching and learning building, you could actually see the lines of sight and how potentially they were kind of obscured. So it's very little things like that you know, hearing from staff and students about their perspectives, how they use the space, not making assumptions about that. And I think that's really key. So again, it's thinking about how the space is used. So Hilary and I have had lots of conversations um, about teaching and learning building, thinking about how then can we involve the conference um, team through that. Um, we've also uh, both worked together on um, the inclusive uh, desi design guide, which Hillary spoke about, Mamie Hillary, um, but thinking about how we could um, incorporate kind of quiet space and sensory space in and going forward. So I visited another un local university to look at their sensory rooms. So thinking beyond the physical access. So again, Hillary and I working together on, on PEEPs, the conference guides, um, and thinking about as well about the small changes that can make um, a difference. And this comes from um, the, uh, an example from the some research that um, the focus groups that I did with a colleague uh, for postgrad postgraduate students and they raised some issues that I then went back to talk to Hillary about and think about solution focused and also with that with the library so for example um, again with less visible um, disabilities thinking about um, the journey from the centre of campus to the train station and the um, street furniture that is there or limited street furniture that is there actually thinking you know if people want to sit down because they've got um you know for all sorts of reasons are those is the street furniture positioned in the right place to you know and and again walking through that that area um, and also there was an, um, something that came to our attention about um, the queues in the library and waiting for um, to access the IT service desk and thinking about how we can manage that um, again because um, you know for some students they, they you know just standing is, is, is tiring um, in that so again we work with the library and with Hillary to think about some possible Possible solutions there. So those are the type of projects that we're kind of working on and still kind of considering. But I think, you know, the key message I would be saying is, you know, that small changes can make it um, you know, a big difference. And it's not just the big um, kind of high profile projects, but it's those little things that make a difference. So that's that's what I would say really. Great, thank you. And um, well, just, just to carry on from this, this is the question for um, the, the two of you. What do you see as the um, as the priorities going forward? Hilary, do you want to go first? OK, she'll step in. OK, so I mean, some of these are very aspirational, my own uh, pass. And of course, one of our big discussion points at the university over the next uh, year or two is going to be funding for some of these things. So um, take it as a wish list. So work on the external spaces and routes around campus. It's quite clear that there's some major work that's required. Um, and to embrace, embrace best practice for major projects, that one I think is, uh, you know, on the cards as it were. I'd love Aston Webb as the focal point for the university to be more easily accessible, and that's physically accessible. Um, working on, I think, so alluded to this, the sign design guide. You know, it's part of the information that people use and navigate around campus. And I think there's quite a bit to be done to try and make sure that we're at the top of our game in terms of the signage that's used on campus and in within buildings. Use the feedback, as Sue's mentioned, with students and staff 
actually giving feedback and live projects to further develop the inclusive design project and keep up with best practice and to make sure that the information that we post is up to date and widely available. So there's quite a lot of things there. <laughs> Keep me busy for a year. And for me, I think I, it echoes um, what Hilary has mentioned, but I think um, I'd like to see kind of access for all and embedded practice rather than going back to bolt on, um, you know, reactive. I think um, we need to be, you know, embedding it in, in our thinking, our planning and our considerations and thinking about more than physical space. Uh, improving the communications and simplifying the process um, and going back to what I said earlier about holistic um, view and review and evaluation and feedback which Hilary mentioned and that ensuring that accessibility and inclusion are key considerations at the heart of new builds and we're really working together um, to, to think about that and how buildings are used and pe how people interact in the space so we've got an added impetus with the blind sports and the commonwealth games coming up um, in the next couple of years but also thinking about lessons learned from the covid experience Experience, um, the importance of being connected in space and on campus and thinking about fostering a sense of belonging. So again, um, you know, kind of more aspirational, but taking um, heed of what we can learn and moving forward to make a campus experience more than just the, it does include the physical buildings, but thinking about a wider access, access to service, access to facilities, access to other people um, as, as well. So I, I think, you know, that's how I see it, you know, going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, well, this is my, my final question, um, but I guess I, I would like to ask, so together, how can we make um, the university experience as welcoming as possible for um, staff, students and visitors? I, th I think that, um, you know, going back to the small um, uh, changes make a difference. I think taking that step back and thinking about the importance of the environment for well-being um, and encouraging um, more use of the wider campus, um, the accommodation, understand how individuals respond and engage with their surroundings, um, involving stakeholders as we, keep, as we keep on mentioning, not making assumptions, and then responding to the changing needs and digital and technological innovation, because I think that also goes hand in hand. And then on a practical level, thinking about um, inclusivity and accessibility as a journey it's you know it, it's ongoing and thinking about how we create through the use of language and signage welcoming environments because again you know having the word welcome to a build in in the building creates that sense of value and I don't think um, we consider how the messages we portray um, through signage and kind of how we kind of advertise space. Um, so thinking about how uh, space is used, but not assuming it will be the same in five years time. And I think that goes beyond head counts or space utilization surveys. Thinking about the importance of green space for all of us, including for our mental health, and we can all have an active part in that. Um, and just thinking about, um, you know just to kind of to throw in there in the uk um the population spends 90 percent of their time indoors and that was surprising to me but you know particularly more so uh, with covid so how do we create that indoor space as well as the outdoor space to be welcoming and so people have a sense of connectedness but also that the buildings are kind of fit for um, purpose. So how do we promote our space? Do we think about well-being maps, collaborative space, calm space, social space, uh, transactional space? And I think, you know, as Hilary has said, learning from good examples and then accepting that nothing is 100% perfect for everyone, but, you know, we need to be aspirational. So I think that's the kind of, we've all got a part to play in how um, we kind of shape that kind of environment and how we kind of create that sense of belonging um, and inclusion. 
Absolutely. Well, um, thank you both um, for, for taking the time to to uh, respond to these questions. Um, we're going to switch over to the, the live stream now and see um, if we've got any questions from the viewers. So we'll see you there. <laughs> So there we go. Thank you, everybody, for, for watching that. Um, and um, thank you to, to Sue and Hillary. Really appreciate um, the, the time you spent um, speaking with me the other day. Um, we, we do have um, one question in the chat, and um, that is, would the sensory needs be helpful while designing a building, e.g. having a smaller playground for autistic children who may be overwhelmed by loud noise emanating from the large playground? Um, the autistic children can gradually be transitioned to a larger playground. Is the collaboration with uh, an occupational therapist considered while designing a building so that the sensory needs of the autistic children can be considered? So I'll, I'll start off, off there. Um, I think it's a really interesting um, question. And I think um, more so think considering the needs of kind of no, neurodiverse students, whether they're children or adults, I think it's something that we've become increasingly aware of at the university, um, thinking about how we use space and kind of working um, to have calm space um, and we mentioned previously about the teaching and learning building, just to give you an example, um, thinking about, uh, particularly for an autistic um, student, raised the concern about the kind of, um, before a lecture, how busy the environment is before a lecture and how overwhelming that was. Um, and the student also felt that they needed to be at the lecture earlier so they could get a space, the same um, seating. So thinking about what we could do there. And Hillary and I had a conversation about having a quiet waiting room, a very small waiting room. So a student could go into that room and just not be part of that kind of overload of information and, the, and that kind of hustle of, of students. So thinking about that and how we use space and having varieties of space and as they, um, I did go and visit um, some sensory rooms at, at a university. They had, um, I think it was three or four different sensory rooms kitted out very differently uh, for a calming environment and also a stimulating environment. Because again, we can't assume that everybody wants um, a calm environment. Some students with ADHD, for example, might want a stimulating environment. So thinking about those things, I'm thinking about, it's about, you know people being safe in that space children being safe in that space and I think with school um, based um, children again it's involving them in that process not making assumptions often people you know who have lived experience have their you know some views on how um, some suggestions so it's that involvement so with children I think it's important to involve um, children as well so I don't know if you've got anything else to add Hilary well, I think it's important to, to understand that lived experience and certainly I found teaching and learning building visits very helpful and would hope you know, every time that we can arrange to do a review of buildings it will feed into the start of the process for the next building along and certainly I've been trying to keep my eye out for sort of guidance in the built environment for neurodiversity and there's very little there at the minute. Um, I am aware there is a group working on it, but sort of certainly the direct experience of our students and staff on campus is, is really valuable. That's great, thank you. And um, uh, the, 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 the attendee says, that's so helpful, so happy that the needs of autistic individuals are being considered as their needs are very unique and often different from people with other disabilities. Thank you. And, you know, that's absolutely right. You know, it, it is about trying to think about things um, in, in as, as wider terms as possible, trying to cover as, as many um, scenarios as possible, as, as many um, different neurodiversities as we can. So um, it's, it's great to hear that, that those are um, firmly on the agenda. Um, so, so that um, ends um, the, the questions. I think that's, that's all the questions we had. Did anybody um, have any final thoughts or um, takeaways that they, uh, key messages? Uh, before we draw the session to a close. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>
Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you so much to Sue and Hilary for their time um, uh, and um, making the presentation for us. Very much appreciated. And of course, we are all available if anybody has any questions following the session. So thank you very much. Have a lovely day and enjoy the rest of Disability History Month.